The year is 1991. Nintendo owns the video game world, and Mario reigns as champion of the home consoles. Others try and fail to recapture the love that made the Italian plumber a name. That is, until one company throws not only their console into the ring, but a mascot to challenge the Italian stallion. Sonic the Hedgehog Everything Mario was, Sonic was not. Mario was slow and methodical. Sonic was fast and frantic. Mario was precise. Sonic was haphazard. Mario was a kind-hearted plumber with a heart of gold saving a lovely princess from the clutches of an evil dragon. Sonic was a flippant hedgehog with attitude who stops the world takeover plans of Dr. Ivo Robotnik, aka the Eggman, simply to see the look of rage on the doctor's face when he wins. It was a calculated move. By being the anti-establishment hedgehog he was, Sonic appealed to the youth crying out for freedom from a mundane society that said that all heroes had to be nice guys, and proved once and for all that heroes didn't have to be rule-obeying Boy Scouts. Nothing could go wrong, right? 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 <laughs> Following the success of the Blue Blur came a tidal wave of mascots with two. And yes, that's apostrophe too, not attitude. With companies now chasing the cool, laden, speed-obsessed gameplay of Sonic without quite getting why Sonic was so much fun. And while this boom did give us, Crash. Crash we also got a lot of. Call me Woody. Wild Woody. And. And do I even need to mention... <laughs> For almost the entirety of the 90s, the mascot with Tude persisted well into 3D gaming, with every company looking for a mascot. That is, until 1999, in which Appalooza Interactive decided that the mascot with Attitude needed to be taken to its most logical extreme. I think the constant meeting went something like this. What if we create a mascot who hates the fact that he's a mascot? Okay. And he has to go on a mission to save the world from the company he's advertising for. Cool. So what animal should we make him? Nah, man, make him a tank. A what? A tank. Okay, tiny tank, everybody! This was Appalooza Interactive's attempt to cash in on the mascot with attitude craze. Except instead of a too cool for school attitude, Tiny had an I'm gonna kick your ass attitude. Where other mascots were a child's idea of cool, Tiny Tank was more adult, playing on the frustrations of hating your job and taking it out by blowing everything up in sight. And the advertising hammered that point home, with most ads depicting Tiny as angry and clearly not someone to be with. It's not the size of your howitzer, it's what you do with it. And plenty of jokes. So does Tiny Tank manage to score a bullseye? Let's pull the trigger on this one. That's the most mealy mouth bunch of crap I've ever heard in my life. I can't believe that came out of my mouth. Somebody shoot me. The first thing we see upon starting up the game, besides developer splash screens, is this. I'm just gonna let it sink in for a couple of seconds. This title screen communicates everything you need to know about this game. EXPLOSIONS, WAR MACHINES, AND TWISTED METAL! All juxtaposed to a child-friendly and calming jingle. That's the sense of humor in this game. And if that title screen wasn't enough, the first cutscene of the game really hammers the point home. Tank, America's lovable... Wait, 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 wait. Is that my theme song? Well, it hasn't been finalized yet. Wanky, wanky, tanky, tanky, what the f*** is that? The story of Tiny Tank is simple. It's the future, and nations can't stop going to war because humans are assholes. And a private company called Centrax proposes a radical idea. What if it made robots that nations could purchase to fight wars for humans, that way there's no human bloodshed? Despite the fact that this would be a stupid idea, as the robots would probably be sent into populated areas anyway because humans are assholes, almost all of the countries are on board with this. All except for one nation, and that's surprisingly America. Yeah, America doesn't want big death machines fighting their wars for them? What's next? A YouTube comment section being civil? Seriously, my suspension of disbelief is gone. But Centrax needs America to give them a yes, and they decide to do the America thing and put it to a vote. So Centrax decides to make a mascot. The first idea is a sexy robot, who is quickly scrapped and made into a satellite. Poor girl. 
and then they decide to go the child-friendly route. Grab one of their mini tanks, paint it yellow, give it a highly advanced prosotronic brain, allowing it to have artificial intelligence, and renaming him Tiny Tank. And he hates it! A cute killing machine? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I got an 80 millimeter cannon for a nose. Hey kids, is this cute? Oops. Tiny Tank knows he was made for the frontline combat and is being used as a rinky-dink mascot. Uh, screw this job, really. Cut to 100 years later, holy hell! And the Centrax army has gone Judgment Day and chased humans underground and are planning to remove all of the Earth's atmosphere, which will cause all the humans to die of suffocation and prevent robots from rusting. And the Scrap Bussy Satellite tells us, Tiny Tank, that we have just been repaired and it's up for us to save the world. Well, that went pear-shaped fast. We eventually find out later that, in a desperate bid for votes, Centrax makes the promise that, if they get a yes vote, they will have Tiny Tank fight the entire Centrax army on his own, with the entire event being streamed live over the internet. And they get their yes vote. Whatever. Don't worry. They're shooting blanks. Well, don't tell them that. What's the truth, isn't it? This is all bullshit. However, during the event, a live round is shot right into Tiny's head, causing his consciousness to spread to the other robots who quickly overrun humanity. These in-between level cutscenes are not only beautifully done, but are the best source for the game's sense of humor. And some of these cutscenes are hilarious. Tiny? What? Lines? What are they? Fred? Fred? No, no I'm, I'm talking, talking to Fred. Fred. Fred? What? Tiny, Tiny lines? lines? Hi there. Hi, Fred. No, that's, that's your line. The game has a mission structure where you enter an area, complete a mission, which usually involves either destroying Centrax property or killing a boss, and move on to the next one. Before each mission, you're given a briefing from the satellite with zooming shots, and these mission briefings are important as she can really give you good advice on how to tackle some problems, and even during stages, but we'll get to that later. I like how all of the missions involve disrupting Centrax's plans to rid the planet of the atmosphere. Whether it's disrupting supply lines, blowing up their raw materials, or destroying a piece of equipment they plan to use in their, well, plan. It really feels like you're taking apart an entire army's plans piece by piece. Is this what Sonic Forces was supposed to feel like? The Death Egg? Oh man, that's not good! None of this is good, Vector. That's why it's called WAR. And when not destroying something, it's usually gaining access to an area via a special method, such as the nanometal cooling center, in which you have to jump on the coolest nanometal ingot and ride it out of the cooling center, or the snow slide near the end of the game, in which you must survive a sliding level down to the base of a mountain. Some levels have interesting gimmicks, like the one where a generator you're supposed to destroy is being guarded by two giant Strider bots who are being shielded by the generator and work off of motion sensors, but like ballet dancing, so moving during the music while they're dancing makes it so they can't see you. Or another level which has you destroying a train bot on a high-speed magnetic track. But yeah, other than that, it's just basically navigating the level to destroy something. Tiny Tank controls, well, like a tank. You move forward and backwards and use left and right to turn your trajectory. Tiny's movements are realistic, moving forward and back has some weight to it, and it takes some time to accelerate to full speed. You'd think this would make combat hard, but it really doesn't. Tiny automatically locks on enemies when you shoot, even automatically aiming at enemies off-screen. So if you're fighting an enemy and they go off-screen, Tiny will continue to shoot at them. And that's nice. Enemies also don't tend to swarm you, so who you're aiming at is hardly an issue. Though there are some times, if there are multiple enemies on screen, it can get annoying when Tiny targets a non aggroed enemy off screen instead of the tank right in front of you trying to blast your face off. But simply use the L1 and R1 buttons with the right stick to get Tiny facing the right way. That's also something you're going to have to get used to in this game. This is a third person action game that does not use the right analog stick to control the camera. In fact, there are no camera controls at all. The camera constantly faces forward in front of Tiny, and you have to change the way Tiny is facing in order to change the way the camera is facing. Pressing the square button will cause Tiny to fire his 80mm cannon nose at anything in range, and while it does decent enough damage, it isn't the only weapon Tiny can use. Enemies can drop their primary weapon, which can be placed on one of Tiny's four corner slots and be used by the tank himself. These range from basic cannons to gatling guns to rocket launchers to even mortars and rail guns. And don't be afraid of using these as Tiny can't run out of ammo. These weapons, as well as Tiny's own base cannon, can be upgraded with prosotronic brains or pea brains. Occasionally, enemies will drop these green orbs, which are the aforementioned pea brains, and these can be allocated to a weapon by holding down the select button and using the right stick, in order to increase its effectiveness. The more pea brains assigned to a weapon, the better it performs, even up to firing automatically. And even though Tiny can't take weapons with him to the next mission, he keeps any prosotronic brains he collects, which can be used for future missions, and thank f**k. 
Positronic brains aren't that common and are dropped very sparingly, so you need to find and hold on to as many as you can, and this also means not dying, as dying can lose you a Positronic brain or two. And trust me, these pea brains are useful, as later stages have you going up against some beefy dudes. The other major pickup is Nanometal, which can be dropped by enemies in the form of their heads, or be found lying on the ground just waiting to be collected. These essentially act as Tiny's second health meter. See, Tiny has a standard health meter, but he also has Fix-It Crabs constantly repairing him, and they can only repair him if he has the Nanometal to do so. Run out of Nanometal, and Tiny can't heal himself. Plus, the Fix-It Crabs can't repair fast, so it's entirely possible to take too much damage and die immediately. So moving through levels slowly is a very good idea, and you're gonna have to get used to making use of the L2 and R2 buttons to dodge incoming fire. Pressing the circle button will make Tiny drop a teeny weeny tank, a much smaller version of himself which can be upgraded with up to two pea brains. A teeny weeny tank with no pea brains will simply hunt down enemies and explode on contact. A teeny weeny tank with one pea brain will gather nearby items and bring them back to Tiny, and a teeny weeny tank with two pea brains will constantly circle Tiny and then run into robots in range and explode. I find that the gather function is the most useful and that hunt and protect are entirely useless. You can take direct control of these teeny weeny tanks by holding circle so that you can use precision, but I've counted once in my game that I've actually had to use teeny weeny tanks, so they're not that useful. Pressing the X button will cause Tiny to jump, and yes, there's some mild platforming in this game. Tiny can even activate jet thrusters by jumping again, and due to the way the game's physics work, the thrusters are more effective when you use them right after jumping instead of at the top of your jump like every other game. And this information is vital in the Atmospheric Reduction Center because... DAMN! The first part of this level is platforming, and you're gonna need all the lift you can get to make these damn jumps. Dear lord, I remember this part frustrating me as a child, and even now I still don't like it, I fucking hate this level, it's so bad! Well, it's not exactly bad, it's just hard. And finally, there's the triangle button, or as I like to call it, the quit button. Yes, just like every other 90s game mascot, Tiny says quips, though they're not near as annoying as some of the other games because Tiny has a different set of quips for each level, and has specific quips depending on what's going on in game. While you will hear him say something smarmy every time he hits a target or kills something, pressing the triangle button will make Tiny say a quip anytime you want, with two major exceptions. The first exception is when Tiny gets a radio call. Sometimes during a level, Tiny's antenna will pulse, meaning you have a message. Green pulses are Tiny, who will turn to the camera and say something about the current situation, and blue pulses are the satellite giving you hints about the level of the task at hand. Enemies have rock breaking pulsar guns. If you acquire one or more, it will be easier to survive the rock shoots. The only time Tiny won't quip is when he's listening to a radio show. You see, Tiny listens to music broadcast by the Centrax Memorial Choir, and in between songs, the main bad guy of the game, New Tank, hosts a radio show in which he talks about the player's progress and answers calls, complete with commercials for machine products such as Rustaway. Thank you, Centrax Memorial Choir. Thank you, gentle listeners. These radio shows are a blast to listen to, as it gives the machine bad guys an honestly human element. As actual enemies you will meet later in the game call with questions from Mutank about how to best Tiny Tank. This is also interesting, as as you go through the game, Mutank's army will slowly start to lose faith in him and even start to turn on him as you continue to wreck their sh**. Line 3. Uh, yeah, hi, Mutank. Uh, is your refrigerator running? Until they're eventually rooting for you when you finally fight Mutank in his orbiting space station. During these audio shows, Tiny will refuse to quip at all, even when you're prompted to have him say a quip. Speaking of Centrax, the enemy variety is great, from hover tanks to machine gun androids, flying bots, walker bots, but the most common enemy types are mini tanks, which are the tank line Tiny Tank comes from, coming in both blue and red varieties. Enemies are simple and will most likely either charge at Tiny firing wildly, or will attempt to jump repeatedly throwing Tiny's aim off. The bosses, however, are a different story. Almost every stage has a boss with a health bar, and these bosses can range from a cowboy robot who stands there and shoots you while you dodge every single one of his shots, kill him, and take his hat. Hehe, <laughs> got your hat, motherfucker. To a tank that's literally invisible except in specific mirrors that you can see him, to a fing armored blimp that can only be destroyed with a specific gun, and since you can't aim that gun upwards, you have to ride updrafts in order to get on his level and aim at him. Or you can put Tiny on a slope and cheese the fight that way. Wait, well, not to see that oversight, Apple losers. Just kidding, this game is great. Aesthetically, the game looks and sounds pretty good. The graphics have that PS1 feel and have a great amount of detail for a PS1. Tiny is nice and expressive, the enemies are distinct and easy to see, and while the game does have that PS1 fog at its draw distance, it never became a problem. The level environments are also great to look at, and match up thematically. You start off in a desert canyon, taking out an enemy base, and then you move on to another desert to destroy a transport ship. 
and then a rock mine, and then another desert to destroy a train. And then you move on to a bunch of industrial levels within factories until you get to a desolate snow-covered mountain in preparation to go off into space in the final level using the transport cannon. It should be noted that there is no plant life anywhere in this game, and it really drives the point home that this is a planet that spent 100 years under machine rain, and that most, if not all, of the plant life has been killed off, leaving any natural areas either a desolate wasteland or industrial metal. The music is great. Like I said earlier, Tiny listens to the radio during missions, and some of these tunes are just awesome, and cover a surprising amount of genres, from hard rock... to industrial... to damn upbeat jazz! These songs are so good they even got Tiny Dancing! Look at him go! He's out there on the dance floor just kicking it up! Sound design could be better, and a lot of the sound effects sound muffled or bit crushed, almost as if they were rendered at a different quality. But it does help accentuate the music and dialogue, so I guess that's intentional. Tiny Tank is a great game if you can get your hands on it. During an era of constantly belching out mascots, Tiny Tank's cynical take on it is surprisingly freshing. Despite a few gameplay hiccups and platforming sections, Tiny Tank is still worth the time I spent on it. 